Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are uh, in Interlaken today. The IPCC has just finished its 58th session. I should also say good morning and good evening because we have viewers from all over the world following us. I would like to welcome all of you to this hybrid press conference by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Today, the IPCC is releasing its synthesis report, the last chapter of this assessment cycle. My name is Andrei Mahicic, I'm the head of the IPCC uh, Communications and I will moderate this press conference. It is dedicated to the IPC, uh, <coughs> sorry, dedicated to the synthesis report. We have a number of distinguished speakers um, today. In the room, we have the chair of the IPCC, Hue Sung Lee. We have the IPCC secretary, Abdallah Moksit, and we have six section facilitators of the synthesis report. Aditi Mukherjee, 
Catherine Calvin, Peter Thorne, Deepak Dasgupta, Gerhard Kriner, and Christopher Trisos. Joining us live online, we will have the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, Peter Italas, and the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, Inger Andersen. Following their opening remarks, the IPCC Chair will make the presentation of the report. We have overall over 800 reporters worldwide registered for this press conference. For those who are following live stream, the instructions on how to submit questions have been already shared with you. For those in the room, please do raise your hand uh, and indicate your name and your media organization. We will try to accommodate today as many questions as we, ha as we can, but due to the high interest, it perhaps may not be uh, possible and take them all, which we'll try to do in the follow-up interviews. And now I ask to, uh, to uh, I, I'm pleased to welcome also the Secretary of the IPCC, Abdallah Moxit, and I pass the floor to you. Thank you, Andrej. And again, welcome to all media representative attending this press conference. Today, the IPCC releases its synthesis report in the fourth, sixth assessment cycle. The approval of the scientific report is the culmination of the IPCC sixth assessment. This is an exp exceptional achievement. The sixth assessment cycle has been the most ambitious in the 35 years history of the IPCC. The IPCC has delivered an unprecedented number of critically important contributions to the understanding of climate change. In total, eight major pieces of scientific work have been delivered during this cycle. Despite the challenges imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, IPCC concluded its work in time. This includes three special reports, three working group reports, the synthesis report, and the methodology report documents. With the launch of the synthesis report today, we are closing this assessment cycle during which the panel held 19 plenary sessions, twice more compared to the previous cycle. More than 780 scientists volunteered their time and expertise to work on IPCC report. 41% of them from developing nations. I would also like to stress that 33% of IPCC authors were female scientists. These numbers are a site of record. Overall, during the drafting of the three working group reports and the synthesis report, more than 100,000 comments were, uh, uh, and pieces of literature were considered and assessed. In the process of related review, our authors addressed more than 300,000 comments. We are grateful to IPCC authors for their firm commitment and exp exp ex exceptional contribution to IPCC work. Given the global relevance of the IPCC work and assessing the science on climate change, it is my honor to announce now the video message from United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Dear friends, humanity is on thin ice and that ice is melting fast. As today's report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, details, humans are responsible for virtually all global heating over the last 200 years. The rate of temperature rise in the last half century is the highest in 2000 years. Concentrations of carbon dioxide are at their highest in at least two million years. The climate time bomb is ticking. But today's IPCC report is a how-to guide to defuse the climate time bomb. It is a survival guide for humanity. As it shows, the 1.5 degree limit is achievable, but it will take a quantum leap in climate action. This report is a clarion call to massively fast-track climate efforts by every country and every sector and on every time frame. In short, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. 
I have proposed to the G20 a climate solidarity pact in which all big emitters make extra efforts to cut emissions and wealthier countries mobilize financial and technical resources to support emerging economies in a common effort to keep 1.5 degrees alive. Today, I am presenting a plan to supercharge efforts to achieve this climate solidarity pact through an all-hands-on-deck acceleration agenda. It starts with parties immediately hitting the fast-forward button on their net zero deadlines to get to global net zero by 2050, in line with the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of different national circumstances. Specifically, leaders of developed countries must commit to reaching net zero as close as possible to 2040, the limit they should all aim to respect. This can be done. Some have already set a target as early as 2035. Leaders in emerging economies must commit to reaching net zero as close as possible to 2050, and again, the limit they should all aim to respect. A number have already made the 2050 commitment. And this is the moment for all G20 members to come together in a joint effort, pooling their resources and scientific capacities, as well as their proven and affordable technologies through the public and private sectors to make carbon neutrality a reality by 2050. Every country must be part of the solution. Demanding others move first only ensures humanity comes last. The acceleration agenda calls for a number of other actions. Specifically, no new coal and the phasing out of coal by 2030 in OECD countries and 2040 in all other countries. Ending all international public and private funding of coal. Ensuring net zero electricity generation by 2035 for all developed countries and 2040 for the rest of the world. Seizing all licensing or funding of new oil and gas consistent with the findings of the International Energy Agency. Stopping any expansion of existing oil and gas reserves. Shifting subsidies from fossil fuels to a just energy transition. Establishing a global phase down of existing oil and gas production compatible with the 2050 global net zero target. I urge all governments to prepare energy transition plans consistent with these actions and ready for investors. I'm also calling on CEOs of all oil and gas companies to be part of the solution. They should present credible, comprehensive and detailed transition plans in line with the recommendations of my high-level expert group on net zero pledges. And these plans must clearly detail actual emission cuts for 2025 and 2030 and efforts to change business models to phase out fossil fuels and scale up renewable energy. This acceleration has already started in some sectors, but investors now need crystal clear signals. And all governments need the assurance that business leaders will help them deliver on extra efforts, but governments must also create an enabling policy and regulatory environment. Shipping, aviation, steel, cement, aluminum, agriculture, every sector must be aligned with net zero by 2050 with clear plans, including interim targets to get there. At the same time, we need to seize the opportunity to invest in credible innovations that can contribute to reaching our global targets. We must also speed up efforts to deliver climate justice to those on the front lines of many crises, none of them they caused. We can do this by safeguarding the most vulnerable communities and scaling up finance and capacities for adaptation and loss and damage. Promoting reforms to ensure multilateral development banks provide more grants and concessional loans and fully mobilize private finance. Delivering on the financial commitments made in Copenhagen, Paris and Glasgow. Replenishing the Green Climate Fund this year and developing a roadmap to double adaptation finance before 2025. Protecting everyone with early warning systems against natural disasters in four years. Implementing the new loss and damage fund this year the longer we wait on any of these crucial issues, the harder it will become. In less than nine months, leaders will gather at COP28 for the first global stock take of the Paris Agreement. They will also launch the process to prepare the next cycle of national climate plans or national determined contributions due in 2025. These new climate plans must reflect the acceleration we need now 
over this decade and the next. By the end of COP28, I count on all G20 leaders to have committed to ambitious new economy-wide nationally determined contributions encompassing all greenhouse gases and indicating their absolute emission cut targets for 2035 and 2040. The transition must cover the entire economy. Partial pledges won't cut it. I look forward to welcoming first movers on the acceleration agenda at the Climate Ambition Summit in September in New York. Once again, I thank the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for showing the fact-based, science-grounded way out of the climate mess. We have never been better equipped to solve the climate challenge, but we must move into warp speed climate action now. We don't have a moment to lose. Thank you. Okay, we have technical problems here in the room, so we will come back to those speakers. In the meantime, then, I would kindly ask uh, Dr. Lee to take over the floor and deliver the scientific presentation of the synthesis report. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, I want to begin by welcoming the members of the media who have joined us today in person and virtually. Your coverage is so important to raise awareness of these climate change problems and solutions. I would like to express my deepest thanks to those who made uh, this report possible. All of you showed extraordinary dedication to producing and finalizing the synthesis, the synthesis report. You worked countless hours driven only by your loyalty to the integrity of the science. The entire world owes you its deepest gratitude, and so do I. I would like to especially thank the section facilitators for their work. I'm fortunate to have them with me on the podium today. My thanks also go out to the co-chairs of the working groups and also to the IPCC's three vice chairs and the bureau members. Everyone involved with completing this report has been an inspiration to me. That includes the Synthesis Report Technical Support Unit and Working Group TSUs. Lastly, on behalf of the IPCC, I offer my deepest thanks to the Swiss government for hosting this meeting in Interlaken. The Synthesis Report marks the end of an extraordinary process. It has produced the world's most comprehensive assessment of the climate change science, the risks of climate change, and response options. The report will serve as the, the resource for policymakers at a critical moment in history, a time when it is imperative that climate action become a much higher priority. The synthesis report brings together the key findings from three previous special reports and three working group reports. It stands on the shoulders of giants that brings forth its own insights and perspectives. The report offers hope and it provides a warning. It warns that the pace and scale of what has been done so far and current plans are insufficient to tackle climate change. The rapid and sustained emissions reductions and accelerated adaptation action is required in this decade to address climate change. We are working when we should be sprinting. In 2018, the IPCC highlighted the challenge of keeping warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Five years later, the challenge is even greater. The impacts of human-caused climate change are unfolding with bracing clarity. More frequent and more intense droughts are more intense droughts and flooding. Threats to our food and water security, illness and death. The report shows that climate impacts are undermining our livelihoods. They are damaging the global economy. And the impacts threaten our life support system, 
the nature itself. Every increment of warming will lead to rapidly escalating hazards and widening regional differences. When the risks combine with other diverse events, such as pandemics or conflicts, they become increasingly difficult to manage. Sadly, as the report makes clear, losses and damages are part of our future. But the report also emphasizes that Effective and equitable climate action now can lead to a more sustainable, resilient, and just world. And more ambitious action will provide wider benefits for nature and people. The report points to multiple feasible and effective options to reduce greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change. And those options for change are already available. The question is, can we deploy those options quickly and effectively, enough to cut emissions to create a safer, sustainable future for everyone? Can we protect ourselves with more resilient practices and infrastructure? That's the challenge. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius requires deep, rapid, and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in all sectors. Emissions will need to be cut by almost half by 2030 if we want a chance to stay at or below 1.5 degrees Celsius. More reductions will need to follow. But action now along many dimensions could result in the transformational change accession to the future we all wish for. A future not just for ourselves, but for generations to come. We already know how to proceed on many fronts. The report identifies tried and tested policies and practices that can work in diverse, in diverse contexts to reduce the emissions and advance climate resilience. But they need to be scaled up and applied more widely. Lowering demand for carbon intensive goods and service, carbon intensive goods and services is a particularly promising way to reduce emissions. When it comes to buildings, for example, lowering demand could reduce emissions by 66% by 2050. Even higher potential demand side reductions are available in land, transportation, and electricity. One of the report's essential findings is the value of fairness. Those who contribute the least to climate change are often the most vulnerable to its impacts. In the previous decade, people who lived in areas highly vulnerable to climate impacts were up to 15 times, I repeat, up to 15 times more likely to die in floods, droughts, and storms. Money cannot solve everything, but it is critical to narrowing the gap between those who are most vulnerable and those who enjoy greater security. The report finds the path to a safer, more equitable, and sustainable future for all requires three to six times the current amount of financing. But there's enough financial resources to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's not just about the quantity of money. It's also about how and where it is allocated. Vulnerable areas just don't have enough money to fund the urgent need to adapt to climate change. But there are ways to reduce the barriers that hold back investment. Governments, through public funding and clear signals to investors, have a key role to play in reducing these barriers. It's critical that climate action makes everyone healthier and safer. Climate solutions extend well beyond financial and technical responses. Support for healthier lifestyles, for example, can, can be good for us and good for the climate. Yes, it is good news that the cost of solar and wind power has fallen. The report underscores that clean, renewable energy is absolutely among the most promising and effective options for climate action. 
But there is more holistic approach. It's what we call climate resilient development. It involves integrating measures to adapt to climate change with actions to reduce or avoid emissions in ways that provide wider benefits to all. Benefits like improving people's health and livelihoods, reducing poverty and hunger, providing clean energy, water, and air. The economic benefits for people's health from air quality improvement alone would be enough, roughly the same, and possibly even larger than the cost of reducing or avoiding emissions. We also know that the path to a more secure future requires political commitment and inclusive governance. It relies on international cooperation, ecosystem stewardship, and the sharing of diverse knowledge, values, and worldviews. Lastly, climate action requires the best of humanity. The report underscores the value of trust, collaboration, and sharing of the benefits and burdens. It calls on all of us, collectively, individually, to do what is in our capacity to make a difference. We need to recognize that we live in a diverse world in, ev in which everyone has different responsibilities and different opportunities to enact change. Some can do a lot while others will need help managing the change. And that change will be shaped by the choice we choices we make starting right now. So let's hope we make the right choices because the ones we make now and in the next few years will reverberate around the world for hundreds, even thousands of years. Thank you very much. We will now take your questions. Uh, be before we take questions, uh, just to say that we've managed to reconnect with uh, Dr. Talas, the Secretary General of WMO. Um, if you can hear us, could you please, um, could you please come in? So, dear participants, uh, sorry for these technical problems that, that they, you seem to have in Interlaken, but uh, but I'm sorry that I cannot join you uh, physically in in Interlaken because I'm on my way to the United Nations uh, Water Conference. Uh, the report that we just heard uh, echoes the findings of all the, of the previous uh, IPCC reports uh, since uh, 1990. Now, with much higher tone, the earlier theoretical risks have been materialized. Climate change is already visible, and its human, economic, uh, and social problems uh, are growing. And the other message is also very clear. It is extremely rational to limit the climate change as compared to the to, uh, inaction or to face its uh, consequences. This report shows that we are at the moment heading towards 2.2 to 3.5 degrees uh, warming. Warming of three degrees uh, would have dramatic impact on human health, uh, 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 biosphere, food security, refugees and global economy. Many of those risks uh, could be avoided if we would uh, reach uh, uh, instead uh, 1.5 degrees warming. WMO will publish its uh, state of climate report in a few weeks uh, where we will show that all of the climate parameters are moving into totally wrong direction. Temperatures, uh, ocean warming, ocean acidification, melting of glaciers, uh, sea level rise, uh, flooding and drought events uh, and concentrations of uh, main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous uh, oxide. Good news is that we have uh, both economically and technically attractive uh, means to limit uh, the warming even to the 1.5 degrees. And the transition is also a great opportunity for new businesses and uh, financial savings. At WMO, we are at the moment promoting early warning services for all initiatives to improve early warning services in 100 countries which do not have a proper multi-hazard early warning services in place and have major gaps also in their basic weather and climate observing systems. 
it is uh, it is uh, one of the most uh, effective ways to mitigate the climate risk to invest in early warning services. We have also a new initiative to monitor sources of uh, and sinks of carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide by using ground-based uh, and satellite measurements and models to assess what's happening in the real atmosphere. And this is supposed to be endorsed by the forthcoming COP28. Our scientific advisory panel and the World Climate Research Program have recommended the establishment of a kilometer scale a climate modeling system to improve uh, the cloud physics parameterization and future estimates of uh, weather extremes uh, like flooding, drought, and, and also to assess uh, the risks uh, of, uh, of Antarctic uh, uh, melting and, and, and uh, dramatic uh, sea level rise up to 10 meters uh, in the future. Finally, I would like to uh, uh, express my great thanks uh, for the authors and hosts of, uh, of, the, of the technical support units uh, for your hard work uh, during the past uh, six years and, uh, and, and uh, to accomplish this uh, sixth assessment report uh, fully and also to co accomplish uh, the three special reports. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General Talas. Uh, we will now try to bring in the UNEP Executive Director, Inger Andersen. Um, yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Inger Andersen here from New York uh, as we start out the water conference. Let me start out by first thanking the IPCC Chair, of course, XCOM, the Bureau, the authors and the Secretariat for their work done during the sixth assessment cycle, which has culminated in this, the summary for policymakers of the synthesis report of the sixth assessment cycle. To all, congratulations. So what does the synthesis report tell us? Well, it tells us, and we know that, that climate change is here now. It tells us that climate change is a real threat to human and planetary well-being. It tells us, of course, that these human and planetary well-being are one and the same. It tells us that we are very, very close to 1.5 degrees limit and that there is even, and that even this limit is not safe for people and for planet. And it tells us that climate change is throwing its hardest punches at the most vulnerable communities who bear the least responsibility, as we just saw with Cyclone Freddy in Malawi, Mozambique and Madagascar, and as we saw with flash floods in Turkey just recently, and which killed together hundreds of people. This report uh, tells us that our collective failure to cut greenhouse gas emissions leaves us on track to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, and that continuing to march down this track will bring further intensification of extreme weather, of ecosystem degradation, and of damage to lives and livelihoods. So we must turn down the heat. We must help vulnerable communities to adapt to those impacts of climate change that are already here. The synthesis report, which chimes with UNEP's own research, tells us that we already have the technology and the know-how to get the job done. Renewable energy instead of fossil fuels, energy efficiency, green transport, green urban infrastructure, halting deforestation, ecosystem restoration, sustainable food systems, including reduced food loss and waste. Investing in these areas and more besides will help to stabilize our climate, reduce nature and biodiversity loss and pollution and waste, the other two prongs of the triple planetary crisis. Deliver many other benefits from cleaner air and healthier nature to decent jobs and more equity. It is frankly the ultimate no brainer. Ahead of us this year lie the UN Climate Action, Action Summit in September in New York and the first global stock take under the Paris Agreement at COP28 in the UAE. These will undoubtedly be important moments to set the tone for action in the second half of this critical decade. But if there's one clear takeaway from the synthesis report for nations, for businesses, for investors, and for every individual who contributes to climate change. It is this. We must move from climate procrastination to climate activation, and we must begin this today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for these thoughtful words. Uh, we will now move to questions, and I'll first turn to the room. Um, Christian, the floor is yours. Um, could one of the microphones be brought to Christian? Hello, my name is Christiana with the German Press Agency. And my question is, is this is a report that has been um, uh, approved by governments. So basically, governments are talking to themselves here with their dire warnings, which is a bit bizarre. But I guess the, question, the, the problem is that uh, a warning and action are two different things. So I wonder whether you could uh, give us, in a nutshell, what is your message to those people who are in power today? And what is your message to the people out there who, um, who are wondering what they can do now as concretely as possible? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And uh, this, this uh, our report, the census report, can be summarized as a, a message of hope. And uh, we know that the, uh, the, the world has suffered greatly from ongoing climate change problems. And if the demand of energy, demand and supply patterns will continue as we have seen so far, and then we will suffer more in the future. And this report clearly emphasized that we do have technology and know-how and tools to solve for the climate problems. And for instance, we have analyzed greatly about the consumption patterns and production patterns, and spe specifically, we have found that great, there's a great deal of room for improvement in the energy efficiencies to, a such, to the tune of can be the demand energy consumption can be reduced by 40 to 70 percent in some sectors within the next two decades that will contribute greatly in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Another instance is the, uh, we found that a great deal of the, the potential for reduction in future greenhouse gas emissions in the urban centers by pursuing a very comprehensive, a climate friendly, a resilient climate friendly development patterns. Those are just a few examples of the, the programs and investment patterns that countries globally, countries can take to reduce the threats of climate change now and for the future. Now, with regard to the, uh, the for some detailed technical the aspects of the message, I invite section facilitators to jump in. So, <clears throat> one of the critical enablers of action that we talked about is the role of finance and financing for investment. Uh, and the message is not really governments addressing it at the core. At the core is the financial system needs to be able to respond to the challenges ahead. And there's plenty of financing that's available for multiple reasons and multiple activities. But our underlying assessment suggests in that context that the investments that need to take place in climate both adaptation and mitigation needs to rise by three to six times at least. And the way forward to do that is the intersection of a couple of things. One is governments are in fact central to give the clear signal that climate change is imminent and has to happen, and governments can do more with their public finances. That's one element. The equally important element is that the financial system itself, the banks, the central banks, the regulators, themselves have to start recognizing the urgency and pricing in the risks that climate action provides. And underlying all of this, finance needs to flow to places that need it most, has the greatest, least access, highest opportunities, and that's in developing countries. So we understand the system that needs to reform, needs to change, and, it'll, and it's possible to do it quickly, sooner rather than later. Thank you. 
Anybody else? Yep. Please, Kate. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so this report is bringing together the state of the climate science um, over the last, um, of, of what you know now. And it's laid out, we, we tell a little bit about where we are now, talk about where we might go in the future, and then what are the options available today. And so some of the key messaging out of that report is about how deep, rapid, and sustained greenhouse gas emissions are needed to reach 1.5, as well as accelerated adaptation to address the climate change we're already experiencing and might experience in the future. And and the report lays out some concrete options that are available today to help address these challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now go for some of the questions online. The question from uh, Le Point. Gadik Ponce is asking uh, for Dr. Lee first, and please do contribute afterwards. How would you describe the differences between the synthesis report of this cycle with the previous synthesis reports? Uh, are adaptation and mitigation the most prominent changes? The major difference between the last one and the current one is the a more integrated nature, integrated approach for climate science, its impact, impact of climate change and response measures into this one standalone documents. Number two, more integrated ana analysis about the synergies and trade-offs between adaptation and mitigation, but mostly on the benefits of integrated approaches for adaptation and also mitigation. And third, it is the, uh, the probably the most important aspects. We brought in the, the human side of the climate change issues. Uh, that was a uh, brief mention of the, uh, this human side, demand side of the climate issues, very briefly in the AR5 uh, synthesis report. But this time, we expanded working groups, expanded greatly the contributions from the social scientists and working group three reports, as well as this, this synthesis report, very much emphasized the importance of recognizing the human dimensions of the climate change issues. And uh, I believe uh, these differences will probably, uh, hopefully, to continue this emphasis on the human side uh, so will continue to be uh, attracting uh, much attention, uh, not only uh, you know, this cycle, but also uh, for the next cycle and thereafter. So anyone that wishes to jump in on this matter, please. So we'll go first to Aditya and then Chris. Thank you for that question. I think one thing that's also different between uh, AR5 and AR6 synthesis report is the focus on solutions. So we are being much more concrete in terms of what can be actually done. Um, and uh, I can talk a bit more around the adaptation. So in the synthesis report, but also in the underlying reports, we actually lay out a large number of adaptation options and make the point that adaptation options would be very context specific, something that can have very high adaptation, you know, improve the resilience in one context can be also maladaptive in another context. So therefore, to make those correct and right decisions, the importance of, um, of uh, consultation the importance of including the local community voices, exactly those who are being more affected, most affected, being a part of that decision making. So I think we lay down the technological solutions, but we say technology alone uh, will not take us there unless we have the right institution policies. And this is where a lot of the climate resilient development kind of discussions comes in. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think this report also makes clear that action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change is more urgent than previously assessed in AR5, and that this decade, actions in this decade are critical for securing a sustainable future for all. I'd also like to emphasize the report has a more integrated assessment than we have had before on 
the linkages between adaptation and mitigation actions and that there are multiple co-benefits both in ecosystems and for human health by integrating adaptation and mitigation. For example, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which are often co-emitted with other near-surface air pollutants, can have huge benefits for improving human health. Shifts to sustainable, healthy diets can also benefit biodiversity by opening up land for ecosystem restoration. So the report points in detail more than in AR5 to the multiple co-benefits we can achieve, not just for the climate, but also for society and biodiversity by taking more rapid climate action. Thank you very much. Next question is for the Secretary Abdallah Moxit. It's from Maxime uh, Menge from West France. The question is, what could be the main aims of the next assessment cycle? And is the IPCC reflecting on the shift in panels written of publication of reports? Thank you very much. Uh, following the past practice, it's at it, the end of each cycle, we have a plenary dedicated to lesson learned as well as future of IPCC. Now what is expected for next cycle is to consider already one selected special report about climate change and cities, and also a report about short-lived climate forces. And of course, during this plenary for the future of IPCC, we will listen to the request for, for, from government what kind of next special support, support will, uh, report will be included. This is about the report, but also what is the focus for IPCC for next cycle. And I, as I highlighted already, the percentage of, of participation from developing countries will be improved, as well as the percentage of participation of uh, gender will be also improved. Not only this, and it was already something was, 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 was highlighted in this plenary, is also the inclusion of indigenous people, indigenous knowledge, as well as involvement for young scientists. In another word, the next cycle will be more open to any participation. This is our uh, uh, our intention and plan for to improve the next cycle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Mitchell Beer. The question is, how do you see this report shifting the focus or outcome of the global stock take at COP28? This report is the resource uh, for the policymakers in addressing the challenges and tasks posed for the global stock take. The global stock take is, as you know very well, is to uh, address the way uh, underst to understand mutually where we are, where we are, and uh, where we want to be, and what is required to achieve that uh, goal. And uh, our report is organized in such a, such a way that all the key findings of underlying working group one, climate science, working group two, impacts and adaptation, vulnerability, and the three, the response measures are integrated and summarized into, uh, the, summa into the synthesis report. So we believe that this report is a standalone report to be a very e effective guide for policymakers and along with the six reports we already produced, those three special reports and working group reports, will provide a valuable resource for the policymakers to address the key tasks for the global stock take. Any uh, uh, more just contributions uh, will be very much appreciated. Okay, the next question, uh, and perhaps this is for, maybe for Peter Thorne and Lee, Dr. Lee. Based on, based on the current science, this is a question from Barbara Moran. Based on the current science, when do you expect the global temperature to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, 
In the synthesis, we took the findings from both working group one and working group three, and the, the finding is that almost irrespective of our emissions choices in the near term, we will probably reach one and a half degrees in the first half of the next decade. The real question is whether our will to reduce emissions quickly means we reach one and a half degrees, maybe go a little bit over, but then come back down, or whether we go blasting through one and a half degrees, go through even two degrees and keep on going. So the future really is in our hands. We will in all probability reach around one and a half degrees early next decade. But after that, it really is our choices. This is why this, the rest of this decade is key. The rest of this decade is whether we can apply the brakes and stop the warming at that level. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Lee from Zetland, Thomas Hebsgaard. Covering climate science, it can often feel like the same points are being repeated again and again. The that time is running out. What do you think are the most important new insights from this report? And do you ever feel like you are forced to repeat the same message over and over again? What we need, science is clear on the issues of climate change. What we need from now is a political will on the part of policymakers, also on the part of constituents that determine who will be the political leaders in each, dis in each domain of their concern. Now, the second point is we need a public support to take the immediate action so that the climate neutral, climate neutral, and carbon neutral world be a realistic world we will have. And the last point I want to emphasize is there must be a personal motivation to be on that trajectory toward net zero goal. So do, I believe these three things are the necessary element for the science to be transformed into a political outcome. Anyone who wish to add, please. Aditi, please. Yep. One of the new messages is this report, I think, effectively bursts the myth of um, endless adaptation. The report clearly shows that at higher temperature levels, the effectiveness of adaptation will go down rapidly. So unless mitigation also happens at the pace that's required, many of the adaptation that we are investing now will not remain as effective as they are today. So I think that's a new and an important uh, message. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is for uh, Gerhard Kriner. It is. Um, sorry, it is from Ingeborg Husse Amundsen. Even if we take action now, is it realistic that global warming will slow down? Thank you. Um, so the question was, even if we take action now, is it realistic that uh, uh, global warming will slow down? And the answer is yes. If we take action now, if we reduce emissions strongly, global warming will slow down. Um, we will see the effects on the global mean temperature trends within 20 years. It's not an immediate effect to see, but it, it will be discernible within 20 years if we take action now. So this is absolutely clear. Thank you. And let me just add one point um, that is linked to that question, about 1.5 degrees, as Peter Thorne has already said. Um, we now have, in 2030, uh, for each individual year, a chance of 40 to 60 percent that the global mean temperature will exceed 1.5 degrees, which does not mean that we will have reached by that point uh, 1.5 degree global warming level in the long term. There's a difference between an individual year and long term warming. Thank you. Okay, the next question um, is from Alistair Doyle. 
Um, it's for Peter Thorne. Um, the question is this. I work for Thomson Reuters Foundation. The report highlights individual actions like mentions of cycling, walking, low carbon diets, mental health, etc. What is driving this change? Is the IPCC trying to enlist everyone in action because governments are failing, uh, are falling short? Uh, so this is this synthesis report is is there's a synthesis of the underlying findings of the underlying literature. It's uh, it's ultimately true that emissions are the result of our individual actions. We are the ultimate consumers. And we are the ultimate people driving or cycling or walking, etc. We need to be enabled by governments. Uh, but action is needed at all levels, from intergovernmental, through governments, through communities, to individuals. Um, we are beyond the point where, as the late great Douglas Adam would say, climate change can be somebody else's problem. If we had had the foresight to act in 1990, to start to act in a meaningful way in 1990, we would have a vast vista of options available to us to still avoid one, uh, stri keep well below two degrees and strive for one and a half degrees. The reality is we, at all levels, governments, communities, individuals, have made climate change somebody else's problem. We have to stop that. We have to act now. It is action across all scales. Do not say it is your government's problem, your community's problem. It is your problem as part of that community, as part of that country to make the difference at this point for the resilient future we need that is resilient to the climate change we absolutely have and avoids as much additional climate change as humanly possible. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I believe Kate would like to contribute. Yeah, one of the roles of the IPCC report is to bring science um, and help inform decision making at all scales. And so in the synthesis report, we assess a number of different options um, and what they, their implications would be for emissions, how much they cost, what we know about their effects on biodiversity or food security or water security. And we do this for a number of actions across different sectors and systems. So we have information about energy op options in the energy systems, options in land, options in cities and settlements, and our role is to bring the science information so that we can help inform decision making. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from the Washington Post from Sarah Kaplan. It's for Dr. Lee. Can report authors respond to the Secretary's general call for developed nations to reach net zero by 2040, a decade before the rest of the world? Is this in keeping with the findings of the synthesis report and in this assessment cycle? And would what would need to happen to make it a reality? Yes, it's consistent because the IPCC's, uh, IPCC's uh, conclusion on our first conclusion on the um, uh, net zero by 2050 means this global, that's, that means global average. Therefore, some parts of the countries or regions must have the, that global net zero, not net zero goal much earlier than 2050. So is it consistent, his message consistent with the IPCC's synthesis uh, report's conclusion, which is also based upon the underlying reports. Now, what can be done from those regions who could uh, who can achieve, can achieve the much earlier uh, neutral, uh, new carbon neutrality goal? Well, those countries were able to pursue a much faster reduction of carbon emissions. They have the technology, finance, and I hope political will. Therefore, they are in much better shape than other parts of the world to be on the trajectory toward the carbon neutrality by 2050. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, and I believe it's going to be our last one because we are close to 3 p.m is from Seth Bornstein from uh, the Associated Press. Uh, it's directed to all panel scientists, but perhaps Aditi may want to start first. For panel scientists, the Secretary General called on developed nations to act faster. How important is it that rich nations act quicker than poorer? And can you talk about how historical emissions and equity factor um, are in there in the report, if they do? 
how much of the problem can be fixed by rich nations? Let me answer first, and then we'll probably uh, invite the others to join that uh, reply. The uh, rich nations, I believe that you mentioned there, has the technology, has the finance, and Dr. Dasgupta uh, uh, already mentioned, uh, to achieve that uh, climate goals, uh, we need to increase dramatically, almost three to six times, the climate uh, fi uh, finance uh, directed to uh, that the climate uh, st stabilization goal. The question is, why, why of sufficient, even if sufficient capital is available, why those capital is not allocated to this urgent, solving the urgent problems of climate issues? That's the key question one really have to think clearly. There are many crises we face every day, and the current gap existing in, gap in the financial sector implies that the financial sector must have a different calculations than the, our scientists think about the necessary financial flows to the adaptation and mitigation. Now, the countries endowed with a rich technology and rich financial resources here has the responsibility as well recognized by the Climate Convention and Paris Agreement to help the other regions lack, lacking those resources so that all of us can have a better future. I invite others to join. Thank you. Um, Aditi, would you like to contribute? Or you? So uh, we are, I think, on the on the on the on the questions that are on the issues that we've raised, and that Dr. Lee talked about. The really the choices that we are now facing are more critical and more urgent than ever before, and it's taking place in the context where there are some progress. It's not that there's been no progress, but the scale of progress that we need to move to, as Dr. Lee suggests, needs to really, it's both feasible and it's possible, and we are more waiting for a combination of actions both by governments to make it feasible and possible, and for the financial system and financial sector, the banks, the, the regulators, the, the pension funds, the others, to start investing cross borders and deeply, not just for mitigation, but to also the public finances need to play a critical role in getting the financing needs for the enormous adaptation gains. And these are investments that at the end of the day have huge rates of return socially and economically. The single biggest, the highest return, our assessment suggests, may well be providing energy access in low-income sub-Saharan Africa. It could be one of the highest return opportunities that we have right now. And that's not even counting even greater return opportunities if one were to address the, in, the losses and damages and avoiding and averting some of these costs from missing adaptation funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we also have one question for Chris. Um, this is from the uh, Portuguese uh, paper Publico. We have established human responsibility in climate change and there are losses and damages already happening all over the world because of it. Now we have to be prepared to pay the price of these damages and practice climate justice? Oop, question mark. So the synthesis report and the underlying reports it draws on, such as the Working Group 2 report on climate impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, have stronger evidence than ever before of loss and damage from climate change and that negative impacts of climate change are occurring in all regions. It also shows that low-income groups have the largest gaps in adapting to climate change and that climate justice, 
social justice, and other equitable approaches can help close these gaps in adapting to climate change, as well as broaden and widen support across society for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and helping deliver the scaled up and far reaching climate action we need in this decade in order to limit global warming close to 1.5 and avoid the worst impacts from climate change. Lastly, the report has a high confidence that the greatest gains in well-being, especially in urban areas, can come from prioritizing climate risk reduction for low-income and marginalized groups, especially people living in informal settlements. Thank you very much. Um, we will be now wrapping up just to check, uh, Dr. Lee, if there are any additional thoughts that you would like to share with the press conference before we close. Yes, let me just point out one fact. That the, uh, in this uh, report, uh, the working group, the uh, worth uh, one, two, three reports and synthesis report, I want to uh, highlight this point. Uh, in AR5, uh, there was an attempt to compare benefits and cost. And uh, the conclusion at that time was that the uh, ranges uh, of the benefits of climate action and mostly benefits of climate action was so large that uh, a meaningful uh, assessment, a meaningful conclusion could not be drawn. And this time, uh, the scientists involved in this aspect, in the, mostly in the working three, three and two, uh, found that the global benefit, global economic benefit of pursuing two degree Celsius stabilization outweigh the global cost of mitigation. So that's a significant message that this report contains, which the AR5 reports did not have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And with that, we will close today's press conference. Um, I would like to thank all of the panelists for being here today and delivering these important scientific messages uh, to the global audience. Um, I would also like to thank all of the journalists who have joined us today, both here in the room and online. As I said, we have altogether over 800 uh, registered journalists uh, following this uh, press conference. Thank you very much. Take care and until next time. Bye-bye.